Tonight on News 5 Live, a Coast Guard murdered in Belize City. The victim, Charles James, was shot in the head. A shootout ensues following the murder. A minor is shot. His family says he is innocent. The state of emergency to be extended and expanded to cover more areas of Southside Belize City. And death by conch shell. Jennifer Griffith's husband charged for her death. These stories and more coming up on News 5 Live. For 19 years, SMART has been the pulse of our nation. A journey of growth, innovation, resilience and unity. From the first call that bridged distances to the data that brought us closer than ever, SMART has been there weaving threads of connection across our beautiful land. We have been active in providing innovative solutions to enhance our customers' lifestyles. Over the years, SMART has developed and provided various services to meet customers' needs. To the dreamers, doers, and the believers, thank you for making SMART a part of your story. For 19 years of trust, loyalty, partnership, and shared experiences, as we celebrate 19 years of connecting lives and dreams, let's keep the rhythm alive. Together, let's continue to shape our future one connection at a time. Come and be a part of the Smart Family, where we empower you and our country, today, tomorrow, and beyond. Smart! Bringing people together! Thirteen million. 835,700 eggs are eaten by tourists each year, fueling our thriving economy. Tourism means business. We understand that there aren't enough hours in the day. That's why RFNG is working to make the process of renewing your insurance policies easier. WhatsApp the words, get started to 670-8700. We will prompt you to select the service you are interested in. Select the service and answer a few simple questions. An RFNG representative will process your request and follow up with you when your transaction is completed. It's that easy. Use WhatsApp and skip the lines. Remember, 
It pays to get it right with RFNG Insurance, a Rogue Group company. It's time for the Banish Belize Hurricanes to make that playoff push to secure the number one seed throughout the playoffs. They're playing basketball. Uh, all around the we world. The uh, uh, <laughs> to the this Thursday night, the Belize Civic Center will not be the same when the free time and defending BEBL champion Benny's Belize Hurricanes buckle against the arrival rebels from the West. There's no love lost between these two storied franchises. It's the Wild West versus the Beast from the East. But you already know. I know the East is the best. All the propaganda that spread, tongues will have to confess. Hurricanes is the poised and ready to launch two of the fans' favorite players, Belize and Nicolas. Phillips, fresh off his college season, and the man himself, straight out of the Saudi Arabian League, Kirk Shabbos Smith Jr. Shabbos. The halftime show will feature the Category 5 girls, the big screen kiss cam, and dance-off competitions to win fabulous prizes courtesy of Cellular World. Don't forget the $1,000 primary and high schoolers poster and battle competition, and the Havanasa Resort first five contest valued at $5,000. One team, one big family. Remember, bring out the entire family this Thursday night at the Belize Civic Center. Canes versus Western Ballers. Gates open at 7 p.m. Tip off time is 9. Hurricanes are one big family. The after party at Thursday Thursday. Sponsors. But we not care, we are real winner. Family. Hurricanes are one big family. And welcome to News 5 Live for Thursday, April 11th. I am Sabrina Daly. A member of the Belize Coast Guard was murdered last night near his home on Consuelo Street in Belize City. 26-year-old Charles James was shot around 8 p.m. in St. Martin's area, which falls under the state of emergency that was issued last month. When police arrived on the scene, a shootout between police and a suspect ensued. 
Before we go to that shootout, we first report on the murder. News 5's Brittany Gordon has the story. 26-year-old Charles James was murdered in cold blood just a few steps away from his home in St. Martin's area of Belize City. James was a member of the Belize Coast Guard for about four and a half years and held the rank of seamen in the force. His death came as a blow to his community, who remembered Charles fondly. Commissioner of Police Chester Williams said that upon arrival, a shootout ensued in pursuit of the assailants, resulting in the injury of 17-year-old Jamal Jones. Last night around 8 p.m., police received information of shots fired on Consuelo Street in the St. Martin's the poorest area. Upon arrival, police observed a male person who was later identified as a member of the Belize Coast Guard suffering from gunshot injuries. He was transported to the Karl Hushner Memorial Hospital where he was pronounced dead on arrival. Police in responding to the incident encountered two men who were fleeing the crime scene at the particular moment. They first encountered a police officer who was off duty in plain clothes and upon the police officer saying to them, police, they turned the weapon at the police but did not fire, but the police fired at them. Um, fearing for his life, he did fire at them. According to Williams, after investigating, Jones was determined to be one of two suspects involved in the shooting and was subsequently detained. They continued fleeing and uh, little after that, they encountered another police officer who was on duty and was dressed in um, BDU. And this police officer came face to face with the two um, alleged gunmen and they fired shots at the police. The police returned fire and the two men continued to run. I can say the police officer um, uniform had bullet holes um, from the shooting but thankfully he was not injured. Moments later the police got information of a person who was seen um, bleeding at a particular location and police responded where they found one Jalen Jones who was suffering from gunshot injury to the foot and seemingly he had already gotten someone to assist him in tying the wound to prevent, um, to, to stop the bleeding. Um, police took custody of Jones and um, from all indications he was dressed in the same clothing that one of the um, two alleged gunmen were dressed in and the uh, police also followed the blood trail from where the officers um, had fired shots at the gunmen and the blood trail led to where he was found. So we are sure that he was one of those persons who um, uh, is involved in the murder and was also um, one of those who shot at the police. James was the nephew of late Winston Tanga James, a figure known for his gang affiliations. However, Williams maintained that this incident was not gang-related and instead driven by a dispute over a romantic partner. Do you believe Mr. James was targeted because of his family relations or because of the neighborhood he lives in or that he may be perceived? We know in the Peace Cup he may have been perceived to be affiliated with the BLC gang. Is that why he was targeted? We believe that it has to do with a woman. And the mother in her life, she claims that her son couldn't have been the one because they are friends. So you believe that this dispute happened between associates? <laughs> you know, you wonder, people they get killed and every time the mothers they come down and son, you wonder who they do it, the most me and Jules, right? Um, because, I don't know, and that is, that is one of our problems. Um, when we have mothers who are condoning, look at how quick this mother last night was in trying to find an excuse for her son. Uh, it's just so sad. Um, but again, who would know best where you are? Your friend, right? So, yeah. According to Williams, the murder weapon has still not been located at this time. We do have um, overwhelming evidence to support the fact that he was one of the persons who went to the house and shoot. But no weapon at this time? Um, we are going back to the area. We, we have been made to understand where the weapon may have been dropped in the um, canal. 
and so we'll be going back to the era with some equipment to see if we can retrieve it. Brittany Gordon for News 5. With these recent incidents in Southside Belize City, Police Commissioner Chester Williams says that the state of emergency needs to be extended for a longer period and expanded to the PIV gang area. He says that officers have been arresting men in that area believed to be gang members since Wednesday night. They are gang members who are involved in this part of Latin. The suspects are from the PIV gang area. And you will know that when the, the SOE um, began, I had said that even though Martins was a part of the, 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 the proclamation, we would not go after Martins because they were behaving. Um, this has now changed that picture, and so certainly um, we will have to deal with those persons from the PIV, and they have to form part of the SOE. Again, I am pushing um, to see if we can have the SOE extended um, for the simple fact that we believe that some of these young men have still not really gotten the message, and we need more time to be able to properly investigate those persons who are under the SOE and uh, the, the one month period would not, su would not suffice. So I am seeking to see if we can get it extended for another month. Police have charged 41-year-old Maynor Rene Ancona with the death of his wife, American national Jennifer Lynn Griffith. Ancona was charged with manslaughter by negligence. Police Commissioner Chester Williams confirmed to reporters today that Griffith died after being hit by a conch shell in the head. According to Williams, Ancona reportedly threw the conch shell by mistake during a brawl that took place in San Pedro town over the weekend. While Ancona has not confessed to accidentally killing his wife, Williams says investigators have enough evidence to substantiate the charge. The pathologist certified that the lady died from a penetration to the head by a projectile. Um, I also think that fragments of the conch shell was also found um, in her head. And so we can see definitively now that it was a conch shell that caused, caused her death. The question now is who threw the conch shell that caused her death. And uh, we have recorded a number of statements from um, persons who were involved in the fight, as well as um, other independent um, witness, witnesses. And from the investigation, it appeared, or we can confirm from the investigation, that the person who threw the projectile that caused the death of the American woman is her husband. And so he will be charged today for manslaughter by negligence. As a security yeah, It obviously. was in the hole. Yeah, he was throwing it this indiscriminately and then it caught, caught um, her and uh, that led to her. It's a very sad situation. I know that um, he must be going through a very, very difficult time now. He, he lost his wife and now he has to be charged for it. Um, for sure, he did not intend to, but in law there is a thing that is called transfer of malice. So, right, so. did he admit to that? Um, no, he, uh, he, no, he did not. No. Has any security footage been reviewed? Um, there is none. Earlier this week, we showed you a viral video showing a man being physically assaulted by two men. The victim of the assault has been identified as Mark Aviles. The footage also shows that during the assault, a toilet bowl was thrown at Aviles. The perpetrator, 30-year-old Emerson Garnett, pleaded guilty to two counts of common assault. And as we reported, Garnett was fined $505. Tonight, the mother of Mark Aviles says she is not satisfied with the charge. She is now pressing the police department to file charges against Aviles's girlfriend and the man who held down Aviles. The mother explained that the incident originated from an argument between her son and her sister. She says that her sister is the partner of Emerson Garnett. We spoke with her off camera today. I know they get no justice from the police, you know. I got to the station yesterday morning. They tell me that the young lady wanted, but I don't see no wanted picture up there, you know. Well, I don't like how the young man get charged for assault. I don't want to get charged for attempted murder, you know. Because he was having a syringe, and he dropped the syringe, missed my son with that, you know. When I see that video, and I put that on, I heard cut it off, and I cry. Can you hurt me? You know, for my own family do something like this to me. 
Hello? Mark was clearly in fear from the moment he saw him. I know. When Mark sees Stepina at the house, Mark get frightened, you know? Because that was two of them, you know? And he never knew that what they're up to. But I want to pick up the girlfriend because she set this up. Oh, why would you say girlfriend set it up? Because she texts my son and tells my son, please bring her food for her, for her, you know? And my son says something when they step in, that this you make I come to, you know? I really want something done about this. I really want to talk to the commissioner. I really want to speak to him because the officer are not doing their job right, you know? I want justice and I will not stop push till I get justice. As we mentioned, there was a shootout between police and the suspect in the Charles James murder. That suspect is a minor who was shot by police officers and taken to Raccoon Street Police Station. His family rushed to the station, pleading that he be taken to the hospital for emergency care. Today, the family further detailed the incident as they saw it and explained that they are ready to take legal action if necessary. News 5's Brittany Gordon reports. Jalen Jones's mother, Sherry Lee Barrow, recounted the night her son was shot. She says that moments before, Jones had been eating food with her before exiting the house. Not long after that, she saw her son running through the street but was unable to ask where he was going. After that, things escalated and Barrow received information that her son had been shot somewhere nearby. My son me come in a few minutes ago, come come eat some macaroni out of the pot with bread so I can eat out all of the macaroni uh, thing. So he come outside, he locked the door, my daughter and come here with me, bring something for me. And me gone, I can tell you, you know, in the bed day. And after that, he had some gunshot gone off. And when I had the gunshot he gone off, I jump up, I frighten out of my, you know, out of the lead doors when I did in our thing, because I always have to worry about my lead boy. Any. Because they like to me, they don't want to target to the police, you know. And I always have to depend on my guards. I did sort of pray for my lead boy, I think, every night. Not knowing it happened close to home. And anyway, my son, I hear somebody come in the yard. So I pop my back blinds and I pop my black blinds. I hear the person run wine. So when I look at it, my son and I had a friend, Jalen, 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 but you know, look back. I uh, think it happened in the same clothes where you may have on for a whole day. I can't tell me if you wash, you know, got no clean clothes and white shirt and black pants. So that thing you had on, right? You can't you know, run. But I don't, I don't take it like that. So I got inside and I tend to the baby and I carry the door and the baby sitting for my knees and I think. And after, when I look now, one of, the, one of his friends call and after I say, Corey, you know, see jail on because you saw that fly. They run through the yard, yeah. And I think I know stop. That why they tell Corey. And after Corey said, me share, I just left jail on and jail on gone up the street. They so, say, so going, it come back right now, you going for something, right? And I think I tell him, but you know, just left her out there, I'm going to eat some macaroni, I think. And after he said, me share, I don't know, I don't know. He gone and he, he gone and after, well, after, after Corey come back. Corey Cook on Hannah for me and say, Michelle really, the jail on me shot, and jail on look like collapse over there, you know, the yard over there, so the police, um, they run on, you know, and move on, I think. Michelle really come move and make them move your son. That way, he didn't tell me, right? Barrow said that she arrived at the scene as quickly as possible and found her son bleeding from a gunshot wound. Jones was taken into police custody shortly after. And I put on my clothes and jump and I go and shoot it. And I run through it, so now. And the whole neighborhood, they rail up because they have a, you know, in the yard, this one, one whole amount of police circle around her, and they don't want to move her, right? And so I had to fight through there, the referee through there, like, like the bustle through there, has a bustle between me and my daughter, the fight through there, forget to one thing, and I thought I had a friend, I thought so he hear me, and I thought he said, Ma, Ma, him, they shot me, Ma, and I thought he said, Please help me, son, please go to the hospital, please go to the hospital, officer, I'm crying right now, that way he said, right? Yeah, can I right now? That way he say, and I thought I said, please, you know, please help me, and you know, stop there to watch me, so I end up the get with and then I pop from me, and I thought I gone and I gone hold my son in my, in my, in my hand, and I think I asked my son, now who hurt him? My son said, ma, he said, when he gone, when he, when, when then I tap in, ma, I don't know what happened, he said, everybody started to run, he said, and he said, I get shot, I don't know who shot me, that way he didn't tell me, you don't know who shot her, right? So when that don't happen, now the police ain't cook on fight and for me and they pick up and put her at the shop back. Barra explained that she, her daughter, and son-in-law followed the police to the station. She claims that upon arrival, she was met with opposition from the police. 
She said that they pleaded for officers to take her son to the hospital for medical attention. Commissioner of Police Chester Williams, however, said that that would go against protocol. As you know, there is a standing protocol that we do not transport injured persons to the hospital. The police only transport the dead. Uh, injured persons are to be transported by the ambulance, and so the police officers had took the young man to the Mahagany station, um, awaiting the ambulance to arrive so the ambulance could have transported him to the hospital. Um, for me, I personally would not want for the police to have escorted him for the main fact that he is the same one who had shot at the police and secondly it was the same police officers that he had shot at who had him in custody so to avoid any um, speculations I would have preferred the ambulance to take him. I saw a live last night where um, persons were going off and saying that the police had the man in the vehicle to bleed to death. Let me say the man injuries were, were, was not life threatening. The bleeding had stopped because they had tied it up with something and uh, the police were just waiting for the ambulance to come and take him. Seeing that the ambulance took too long, the police eventually took him to the hospital. But again, persons were flustered because they were not allowed to go near the police vehicle and that could be for the simple fact that when you have a person who is um, accused of killing another um, in the same area, you won't want to have any anybody approach the vehicle that he would be in because what if it would have been associated with the person's person that he had killed who would have wanted then to come and just kill him in the police vehicle. So police had to make sure that the accused was safe while in their care uh, at that particular moment. Barrow maintains that her son was not the type to associate with gang members, nor did he have any conflict with his neighbors. She said that she was unaware a second person had been detained for the murder and firmly believes that her son was not familiar with any of the parties involved. Was there any conflict that your son was involved with anyone in the area recently? No, ma'am. And if my son may do anything or involved in anything, I may be the first one to know everything. Because he always come and find me. Now, one thing with my kids say, I raise them a type of way they don't hide nothing for me, ma'am. My son don't have no conflict with nobody here, nothing like that. Brother-in-law of the victim, Joseph Camp, stated that the family is prepared to take legal action against the department if necessary. He claims that the department is discriminating against his family members and alleges that both he and his mother-in-law were assaulted and pepper sprayed the night of the incident. So we filed a, uh, a professional standards report this morning with the police department. We do intend to hire lawyers and seek every legal remedy that we are afforded here in Belize as well as internationally. Uh, I do have my legal team in the United States aware of this, the U.S. Embassy as well. Um, I, and I intend to seek every legal recourse for myself, my in-laws, and my brother-in-law. Uh, reviewing what I spoke with the detectives this morning, they do not have any physical evidence connecting my brother-in-law to the shooting of the Coast Guard officer. What they have is speculation and they have a profiling of my brother-in-law, which I believe is very disturbing and very disgusting. Brittany Gordon for News 5. Coming up, Minister of Tourism supports reinstatement of Minister of Blue Economy. <laughs> Well, sir, I really go through some stress with my barber. This man here, they push my hairline way back to the 90s. Sure. Uh, people, they call me BB Buck Buck Farid now. So I got a problem, right? I just do this for a shoot, and I want the best for the shoot. But somebody don't want me to keep post it up. Mm -hmm. I just tired of this man. I don't want to tell her to catch me for my way. I stopped at the shop and I tell the lady I want five dollars tacos. You could imagine what they give me? No, no, no. <clears throat> what are your problem? Honestly, life good for me over here. I just upgraded to the Digi One Elite. I have unlimited postpaid plans, Digi TV, free home phone, and the fastest home internet. I went upgrade man's no. All the preparations have been made. 
it's time to enjoy the festivities. On April 12th and 13th, it's the grand opening of Quality Poultry Products Quality Food Supermarket and Chicken Express. Bring out the entire family for not one, but two fun-filled days. There will be Bouncy House, a mechanical bull, free food and drinks for purchases made, music, free games, and of course, discount on chicken. It's going to be crazy fun. How do you get there? Just drive on down to the corner of Branch Mouth and Joseph Andrew Drive and get in on the celebration. Mark your calendars. April 12th and 13th. Opening ceremonies start at 10 a.m. Quality poultry products. This stuff for wheat chicken. Disgracefully exposed as having abused his ministerial powers for personal pleasure, Andre Perez is brought back into Bresenio's cabinet as if nothing ever happened, confirming that the promised review of his actions by the Attorney General was only a charade to ease public pressure at the time. The municipal elections now behind them, it is back to business as usual for Bresenio and the PUP. They are not serious about good governance. I don't care what anybody says. If the government will not change, then the people will have to change the government. Tourism Minister Anthony Mahler is supporting the reinstatement of his cabinet colleague, Andrew Perez. Minister Mahler, like the other cabinet ministers we have interviewed to date on the reinstatement, pointed to the fact that no formal complaint has been made against Perez. Perez was accused of sexual misconduct by attorney Wendy Ogzalu, who says that she does not need to make an official police report. Minister Perez and I share a very close relationship in cabinet um, and outside. I go to San Pedro and we strategize. We have some major uh, projects uh, on the way for um, improving the product in San Pedro and we'll begin to launch those projects. But um, there has been no formal report or anything like that. And, and, and I support the, the decision by the Prime Minister to bring back Minister, uh, Minister Perez to, to the cabinet. Last night, we told you that the Belize City Council is still without a city administrator. The post became vacant following the unfortunate and untimely passing of former city administrator Stephanie Lindo Garbutt. Reports indicate that at least three applications have been submitted. According to reports, among the applicants are former city councillor Albert Vaughn and the party's secretary general, Linsford Castillo. The move to fill one of the most powerful seats in the city appears to be causing some tension. A group of six recently elected councillors wrote and signed a letter to Mayor Bernard Wagner saying that they wanted to be a part of the decision-making process. In their letter, the councillors noted that a suitable, qualified person must be appointed to the post of city administrator. Mayor Wagner responded in writing, denying the request. Further reports indicate that there is a rift at the central government level between Ministers Francis Fonseca and Anthony Mahler, over which candidate is best qualified for the position. Today we asked Minister Mahler about it. Here is what he told us. I would just hope that the City Council selects the most uh, qualified person. Uh, that is the most important uh, management position in the Council. Uh, that that position drives everything for the council in, in, 
that person should have the highest level of integrity. Capacity is very important, and I will stress capacity is very important. So um, we will see where it goes from there. Do you have someone that you favor for this position? No, I, I just want them to make the right decision. Has the city administrator decision created any sort of rift between you and Minister Fonseca? No, no. I, actually, I was uh, at a pleasant um, presentation yesterday in Belmopan. Uh, if you could go on his Facebook, you could see it. Um, we had lunch together. We, we had um, some uh, good discussions with ambassadors from all across the world. Uh, and they, they play an important role in getting the name Belize out there as well. So it's a, a continued partnership. Um, uh, and that's that. The Canadian government is warning its nationals to exercise a high degree of caution when traveling to Belize. The advisory notes that there are high levels of crime throughout the country and that travelers should avoid non-essential travel to Southside Belize City. This is due to gang and drug-related violence, including murders and shootings. The advisory highlights the recently declared state of emergency in Belize City and the Cayo District. Today, we asked Tourism Minister Anthony Mahler about the advisory and his message to Canadian travelers. We take it seriously and, and we're in, in constant dialogue with our PR agents in Canada. Uh, we had a discussion in cabinet about uh, the state of emergency, what it means uh, and, and how we can uh, minimize the negative impacts it ha has on uh, our industry. Uh, and so we, we, we're talking about it. I think the state of emergency is a, a last resort by the government and, and so um, when we had to utilize that, uh, it w was to kind of contain the violence that's happening here in Belize City and other parts of the country. Uh, but it, it is important for us to be able to uh, properly articulate what we're doing to our partners internationally because they are not here. They don't understand that it's only a small piece of real estate that the violence is happening uh, and not in any other major tourism destinations. And so we have to do a better job in terms of advising them. So with that in light, what do you say to Canadian travelers or those considering coming? Uh, come to Belize, it's safe. Tourism stakeholders gathered in Belize City today for BTB's Boom Forum. The event featured a wide range of speakers, including local and international experts on tourism. It is organized to update stakeholders on the marketing strategies the Belize Tourism Board is employing to attract visitors. The forum is also used to disseminate information on emerging tourism products. Stakeholders often leave with a greater understanding of why people are traveling and what they are looking for. News 5's Paul Lopez reports. The worlds of emerging technology and emerging tourist destinations are colliding through virtual reality headsets. Meridian Treehouse is behind this technological tool being used in the United States to promote Belize to potential visitors through virtual immersion. Today we had the prime example of it. We had someone who came and she went diving with us with our VR and she pulled her headset off. She's like, I've never been diving before, but now I really want to go. That's what I did. And that's exactly what the whole, the great thing about virtual reality is your brain thinks of it as a memory. So your brain processes being involved and being part of VR than it would do differently if it were just sitting and watching a video. So your brain remembers it as a memory, so then it feels like something you've done. So you're like, okay, I've done that before. I can do that. I can do it again. So it's really great for tourism. to Think about ways that you want to get people to maybe come to a country, to come see Belize. Perfect examples right there. Like, okay, great. I've seen the coral reef, a little bit of it. I want to go see more of it. Attendees of the Belize Tourism Board's Boom Forum received a first-hand experience of what potential visitors to Belize are exposed to through virtual reality. The building on our Momentum Forum is being hosted in Belize City for tourism stakeholders from across the country. The Minister of Tourism, Anthony Mahler, told us more. This is uh, what we call boom building on our Momentum and it's just to keep the private sector and Belize informed of what we're doing in terms of marketing and some, in some instances product development. January was a, a very strong month, February was a record-breaking month and for the first time in history we did over 60,000 for March which we did close to almost 70,000 uh, and, and those are, are very strong numbers compared to the benchmark which is 2019 that's about almost 18% over that. Our main strategy was to 
build strong airlift into the country. Um, we've worked tirelessly with the private sector to ensure that we make noise all across the world and to ensure that we focus on our key source markets specifically. Uh, but we have worked in, in partnership with the private sector to, to have these numbers. According to statistics, approximately 86% of the U.S. population says that they intend to travel this year. 59% of the population, or more than 150 million Americans, will travel abroad. The Belize Tourism Board is partnering with the Zimmerman Agency to attract some of those travelers to Belize. We're a 360 agency. We do anything from the website to our marketing efforts to research, to PR, to social media, uh, to media buying. Really, we're a one-stop shop uh, for Belize. Um, and, it's, and it really helps because we don't have to talk to other agencies about what we're doing. We really collaborate together uh, with the BTB and, and, and Belize in general. Um, our efforts are to get people from the United States to Belize uh, by any means necessary. Uh, but we have a very strategic approach uh, utilizing research and data um, that can really help us narrow down our audience all the way down to the zip code. Some top things that the U.S. market really likes about Belize is the fact that it's the only Caribbean destination and really in Central America that speaks English. English uh, as a main language um, as well as the US dollar um, so just some key points that help people get here outside of just the people and outside of just the beautiful destination that just makes it simple to get here and as Belize's tourism products continue to improve and attract visitors from across the world Minister Mahler says it is not lost on him that there is a lot more work to do as an emerging destination we're still uh, an emerging destination uh, so improvement to the airport is important, improvement to the infrastructure is important. More, we need more electricity on San Pedro, we need more water on the Placenta Peninsula, uh, we need more amenities at the attractions, uh, and those are the things that we're working on as, as well. Um, but we have high-end products, we have middle-income products, and then we have uh, um, products for people at the lower end of the spectrum. And so we have something for everyone. Reporting for News 5, I am Paul Lopez. After the break, Lindbergh Flowers was murdered. But first, here's the weather update with data from the Belize Men's Service. us at the Belize Earth Day, a creatively green pop-up happening at the Memorial Park on Saturday, April 20th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Shop from a wide selection of eco-friendly boots, light, soul handmade clay jewelry, Hello Body Belize, Naturally Belize Cosmetics, Belize Eco Bag, Zero Belize, and so much more. Enjoy delectable food and beverages from Don Ceviche, Iguana Stop, Brain Freeze Margaritas, just to name a few. Live performances by QB and Ban, Britney Star, and Yes Talia. For more details, call us at 227-2420. The Belize Earth Day pop-up is brought to you by the Belize Tourism Board in partnership with the Belize City Council. Sponsors include DigiWallet, Coca-Cola, and the Belize Waste Control Limited. See you on April 20th at the Memorial Park. Belize City, are you ready again? It's B-E-B-L Basketball. It's all happening on Sunday, April 14th, inside the Belize Civic Center. Come and witness the Tiger Sharks versus Film upon Georgia and always break. That's why I like to pick the boat, yeah. Bring out the entire family this Sunday, Belize Civic Center. Doors open at 4 p.m. and game starts at 6 p.m. Music, food, drinks, and giveaways. Big giveaways at the halftime. San Pedro Tiger Sharks versus Film upon Georgia. It's all happening on Sunday, April 14th, inside the Belize Civic Center. Doors open at 4 p.m. and game starts at 6 p.m. After party will be at Reggae Sundays at Thursday, Thursday. Sponsors are Real Bad Man. For 19 years, SMART has been the pulse of our nation. A journey of growth, innovation, 
resilience and unity. From the first call that bridged distances to the data that brought us closer than ever, SMART has been there, weaving threads of connection across our beautiful land. We have been active in providing innovative solutions to enhance our customers' lifestyles. Over the years, SMART has developed and provided various services to meet customers' needs. To the dreamers, doers, and the believers, thank you for making SMART a part of your story. For 19 years of trust, loyalty, partnership, and shared experiences. As we celebrate 19 years of connecting lives and dreams, let's keep the rhythm alive. Together, let's continue to shape our future one connection at a time. Come and be a part of the SMART family, where we empower you and our country, today, tomorrow, and beyond. Smart, bringing people together. Police confirmed today that 59-year-old Lindbergh Flowers was murdered. He was stabbed to death by another man on Monday morning in Belize City. At the time, police were not sure how Flowers died. But subsequent investigations reveal that he had been stabbed several times over an affair he was having with a woman. We have sent the, the statements and what we have to the DPP, and uh, the DPP is awaiting the postmortem examination. Um, we have confirmed that he was stabbed by someone inside the house, another man inside the house. And so based on the evidence that we we have at this time, the person, the other man, as well as the lady, were released from custody pending the postmortem, at which time the DPP will be able to give us um, a definitive answer if we're going to charge, and if yes, what the charge is going to be. Accused murderer Elmer now continues to proclaim his innocence. He stands accused of murdering brothers John and David Ramnerace and John's wife, Vivian Ramnerace. Last week, during the trial of the Bladen 12, Nas slipped News 5 a handwritten note in which he said he was innocent and that an enhanced version of the security video which captured the murder could prove it. On Wednesday, Nas sent this newsroom another handwritten letter. In this latest letter, Na highlights different time codes, pointing out certain aspects of the shooter. Today, we asked Police Commissioner Chester Williams about it. There are a number of evidence that, circumstantial evidence that points towards not being the one responsible for that particular killing. But certainly with what he had, what he had provided, we will explore that possibility. For a matter of fact, we are doing so at this time. So to answer your question, it is being looked at. But I don't want it to come across as if uh, we are exploring other possibilities because we're not sure as to the, the nature of the case that we currently have against him. So that video looks pretty grainy. <coughs> is there the potential to actually enhance that? Um, we have um, solicited the assistance of the U.S. Embassy, and um, we had sent that video footage abroad, and to some extent it was enhanced, not as good as we wanted to, but the, the experts in the U.S. Um, did do what they could do with it for us. The matter of the escort, I believe I have, I have addressed that in full. Um, we have looked at the surveillance footages from the van that normally does the escort as well as the body cam footages from the police officers who conduct this escort. And there is nothing, absolutely not one iota of evidence to support the claim that Na is making. You have to understand, you said he was you know, threatened um, to compulse. You have to so understand. Does he feel unsafe? They Na, will kill our next way? Na is very crafty. And Na has an attorney who is, who is 10 times more crafty than he is. So I... I um, I don't know what else to say other than what we have said to you, that we have done the investigation and there's nothing to show that. As you're claiming that there's reckless driving, no. Um, Speed. 
romance. There is none. There is none. The, the, the camera for the van is there, but, um, <laughs> and there is no evidence to show that he has been threatened by anybody who escorted him. Minister of Sustainable Development Orlando Habet is resting at home after he was involved in a traffic accident that could have potentially left him with serious injuries. Habet was reportedly heading from Santa Elena en route to his office in Belmopan when his SUV and a truck collided into each other. And Habet's vehicle ended up on its roof on top of the guardrail on the side of the highway. Luckily, the minister did not suffer any major injuries, but he was taken to the San Ignacio Town Hospital for observations before he was released. Abet has reportedly expressed gratitude to everyone who has sent well wishes to him and his family. A large amount of cash was stolen from West Track in Orange Walk. The crime was discovered this morning by an employee who realized that there was a break-in. The employee observed that the building had been ransacked and that a window was broken. He found that over $71,000 was missing from a safe and up to $15,000 was taken from the cashier's drawers. It is believed that the burglars entered the compound by cutting a hole in the fence. When we return, opposition raises concern over reported nepotistic hiring in Corozal Bay. Shop smart for your Samsung devices in Belize and enjoy benefits you won't get anywhere else. When you shop locally for your Samsung, all your devices will be covered by a one-year local warranty. You won't get that when shopping with the other guys. When in doubt, always look for the Cellular World seal to know you're getting the real deal. Shop with confidence and enjoy your Galaxy knowing that it can be repaired locally at our Samsung Service Center by certified Samsung technicians using original parts and machinery. Even better, enjoy the best LTE experience in Belize knowing that your Samsung devices are compatible with major local carrier networks. Get the ultimate Samsung Galaxy experience only when you shop from authorized Samsung resellers nationwide. Here's how to be a part of Benny's homecation in three easy steps. First, download the B-Bucks app and sign up to be eligible. It's fast and easy. Then, shop at any Benny's location or Benny's entity. Remember to choose products from our monthly homecation jackpot categories to earn entries. Now you can earn V-Bucks with purchases made and be a part of the Benny's Homecation jackpot for a chance to win the $10,000 grand prize in December. Win the ultimate homecation with Benny's quality and savings. Hey Belize, come join us at the Belize Earth Day at Creatively Green Pop-Up happening at the Memorial Park on Saturday, April 20th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Shop from a wide selection of eco-friendly boots, light, soul handmade clay jewelry, Hello Body Belize, Naturally Belize Cosmetics, Belize Eco Bag, Zero Belize, and so much more. Enjoy delectable food and beverages from Don Ceviche, Iguana Stop, Brain Freeze Margaritas, just to name a few. Live performances by QB and Band, Britney Star, and Yes Talia. For more details, call us at 227-2420. The Belize Earth Day pop-up is brought to you by the Belize Tourism Board in partnership with the Belize City Council. Sponsors include DigiWallet, Coca-Cola, and the Belize Waste Control Limited. See you on April 20th at the Memorial Park. The Easter break is over, and now it's time for the Banish Belize Hurricanes to make that playoff push to secure the number one seed throughout the playoffs. They're playing basketball. Uh, all around the we world. The best uh, uh, to the this Thursday night, the Belize Civic Center will not be the same when the free time and defending BEBL champion Benny's Belize Hurricanes buckle against the rival rebels from the West. There's no love lost between these two storied franchises. It's the Wild West versus the Beast from the East. But you already know. I know the East is the best. 
All the propaganda then spread. Tongues will have to confess. Hurricanes is now poised and ready to launch two of the fans' favorite players, Belizean Nicholas Phillips, fresh off his college season, and the man himself, straight out of the Saudi Arabian League, Crack Shabba Smith Jr. Shabba. The halftime show will feature the Category 5 girls, the big screen kiss cam, and dance off competitions to win fabulous prizes, courtesy of Cellular World. Don't forget the $1,000 primary and high schoolers poster and battle competition, and the Havanasi Resort first five contest valued at $5,000. One team. One big family. Remember, bring out the entire family this Thursday night at the Belize Civic Center. Canes versus Western Ballers. Gates open at 7 p.m. Tip of time is 9. Hurricanes are one big family. The after party at Thirsty Thursday. Sponsors. But we not care, we are real winner. Family. Hurricanes are one big family. According to the UDP's deputy chairman, Alberto August, who is a member of the Elections and Boundaries Commission, there have been several nepotistic appointments. Reports are that the sibling of an elected area representative has been appointed as the new Elections and Boundaries Registrar for the Corozal Bay constituency. The UDP says it raises concerns about her impartiality when conducting her duties. UDP Chairman Michael Perifi told the media today that this is concerning. We have serious concerns, especially when siblings of era reps or siblings of contestants for um, constituencies are working in the registration office. There's a lot that has to be done when a person is registered. You should go and check that the person actually lives there, for example. Sometimes that has to take place at night, during the day, whatever. Um, there's always the fear, the legitimate fear, that if you have someone there who is assisting in a particular capacity, then they can bypass all those checks and balances that are required for a person to be registered there. However, we would like to know exactly what role the person was playing there. We were informed, for example, that the uh, relative of somebody in Corozal was employed for just a month. Um, well, well, why just a month? What, what was so peculiar about that month to have that person there for just that one month? And not only that, what did that person do? What was their role? What was their purpose there? It just means that we have to be vigilant with our scrutiny, we have to be vigilant with what we are doing to make sure we watch the government, watch every aspect. It's kind of like when you're playing basketball, we would say sometimes for ourselves that from the referee, we have to meet. UDP Chairman Michael Perifit also took shots at the Prime Minister for appointing additional ministers of state. As we reported, three elected area representatives were elevated to ministers of state. Perfeed questioned the purpose behind that decision and the role that newly appointed ministers of state will fill. Here's how he puts it. I guess the prime minister has to, has to find employment for those who he believed delivered in, in, in the March 6th municipal elections, or at least to give them an inner trap to hopefully maintain that majority of 16 at the next general election. So he wants to keep everybody happy at, at, at any cost. Um, <clears throat> but we have to remember ministers of state are not full ministers. They don't, they don't sign any statutory instruments, for example. They don't play any role other than essentially being sort of in between the CEO and the minister. Um, the minister is the minister. John Brisenio said that himself when referring to Chris Cowie. He said he's the minister of state. I'm the minister. So anything happens in finance, it's me, it's not him. Um, I can't see what the purpose of some of them were other than maybe a, a bump in salary, a bump in privileges, I don't know. And then again, this government does strange things. We have a, a non-minister of state who is as powerful or not more powerful than certain ministers 
with cabinet privileges. So they, they, they create whatever they want to create. They, they come up with, with all sorts of things. And it would be interesting to know what these new ministers of state will do that the CEOs and the ministers weren't doing before. A motion voted on by the UDP's central executive to remove John Saldiver and Danny Grijalva as standard bearers for their respective constituencies has been withdrawn. The motion was tabled after Saldiver and Grijalva and other UDP officials, including Patrick Faber, boycotted the party's National Party Council meeting. This did not sit well with certain members of the party. But cooler heads prevailed, and the UDP is once again singing Kumbaya, well, for now, as they work to establish a strong presence in the 2025 general elections. Party Chairman Michael Perifit told us more. Cooler heads prevail to the chagrin of the media, right? You, 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 you don't like to see the UDP at peace and moving forward. It's, it's an internal matter. Um, it's an internal matter, Paul. Um, we're a... We're a democratic party, you know, but we're also united in, in the cause um, to, to good governance and proper representation of the people. People have their opinions in the UDP. The opinions are strong. And from time to time, we make those opinions known and our opinions come. This is not like the UDA and the PUP, where a person like Alan Pollard, even though he tops the polls every time, he's told he can't run from here. That's not the UDP. The UDP is open. The UDP is democratic. People have their views. And, and sometimes that, that, like any other family, it leads to some strong talk and some, and some aggressive situations. But the cooler heads are always prevailed. That's the story of the UDP since 1973. And so it's not like anything to get all excited about. It's an internal matter. It was dealt with internally. And we move forward. Up next, books about Japan donated to Leo Bradley Library. Every day, we access energy for cooling, lighting, and powering our electrical appliances and devices at work and at home. During cooler months, we rely less on cooling appliances such as fans and air conditioners. However, during warmer months, as the temperature and humidity rises, we use more energy to cool our spaces and our appliances and electrical devices work harder than they do during the rest of the year. When the months become hotter, let's all practice energy conservation. Here are a few changes that you can make to manage your energy use. Check that all appliances and electrical devices are working efficiently. Turn lights off when not in the room. Unplug chargers, appliances when not in use. Turn off fans and TVs. Use energy-saving light bulbs such as LEDs. And look for the Energy Star products when purchasing appliances and electrical devices. These easy changes can reduce energy use and costs. You can also monitor your energy use during the month by reading your meter and calculating the reading using BEL's bill calculator on our mobile app or by visiting our website. Let's all save energy. Upcoming enhancements to my social security. The new healthcare provider feature seamlessly connects healthcare providers, insured persons and employers to facilitate the payment of sickness benefits. Here are the enhancements. Registered healthcare providers will create and submit online medical certificates using their healthcare provider accounts. Insured persons will receive a link to view the medical certificate to complete and submit their sickness benefit claim. And employers will receive an email notification of their employee's sickness claim. Also, the insured person and their employer will receive a copy of the claim decision letter after review. Healthcare providers, insured persons and employers are encouraged to create a portal account to access and benefit from these new services on My Social Security at ssbportal.org.bz. My Social Security Online Portal. Social Security at your fingertips.
For 19 years, SMART has been the pulse of our nation. A journey of growth, innovation, resilience, and unity. From the first call that bridged distances to the data that brought us closer than ever, SMART has been there, weaving threads of connection across our beautiful land. We have been active in providing innovative solutions to enhance our customers' lifestyles. Over the years, SMART has developed and provided various services to meet customers' needs. To the dreamers, doers, and the believers, thank you for making SMART a part of your story. For 19 years of trust, loyalty, partnership, and shared experiences. As we celebrate 19 years of connecting lives and dreams, let's keep the rhythm alive. Together, let's continue to shape our future one connection at a time. Come and be a part of the SMART family, where we empower you and our country, today, tomorrow, and beyond. SMART! Bringing people together! Tourism has increasingly become a bread and butter industry for Belize. And over time, there have been new and innovative types of tourism that have taken flight in Belize. One of these is agro-tourism, agriculturally based activities, operations that attract tourists to a farm or ranch. That is exactly what Shaw Creek Farms in the Cayo District has been engaging in lately. It is a relatively new area that the people at the Ministry of Tourism hope will result in more foreign exchange for Belize. In this week's edition of Belize on Real, News 5's Marion Alley brings you details of an agriculture initiative that the folks at Chalk Creek Lodge have embarked on that has the blessing of the Ministry of Tourism. <laughs> At first glance, the Cha Creek Organic Maya Farm might resemble any other farm in Belize that produces agricultural perishables. But this facility caters for agrotourism, a whole different aspect of tourism. It offers a whole different experience to tourists who want to learn about what they eat and how they can grow these products where they come from. Uh, agrotourism worldwide is like, uh, the last I checked, about a $60 billion mark uh, industry. Um, but I think in Belize the way we are approaching it uh, is in two levels. The first level has to do more with the supply chain. Right? It's about ensuring that the food that goes on the table of our restaurants and within our hotels and all of that is at a consistent and high quality. Um, and that is one of the major areas of um, work that we're doing with our partners at the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, in the past, we have done like consumption studies to understand what are our tourists really consuming? What local products are they consuming? What more do they really um, are, are demanding? But one of the main reasons why people travel is to enjoy food, the culinary tourism. And all of that is linked together. It's important that we uh, merge both, both uh, sectors. Uh, agriculture and tourism, which are major contributors to the economy. Um, agri-tourism provides a unique, unique, unique experiences for our visitors, uh, where, where they come and visit farm families, um, share share the table with the farm families, uh, and even the activities in the farm, helping um, planting the crops, reaping, reaping harvesting, and, and even sharing the, our um, Exotic fruits. Chief Tourism Officer at the Ministry of Tourism, Abel Castaneda, and District Agricultural Coordinator at the Ministry of Agriculture, Miguel Balan, believe that merging tourism with farming and agro-related activities can earn even more revenues for Belize. Mick Fleming is the owner of the Cha Creek Lodge and Cha Creek Organic Maya Farm. He said it all started out with him trying to curtail on expenses to feed his staff and guests but then it took a different direction. If you're feeding 300 people a day to be able to grow everything from melons to, you know, to lettuce to you name it, you know, it's just too difficult. Uh, but there are certain things, in particular lettuce and, and uh, basil and uh, you know, some of the other sort of more unusual vegetables uh, we started to, to grow, um, really to supply the kitchens, both here and at Guava Lim. However, you know, more and more people are interested. I mean, we do trips back almost every day, either on horseback or on one of our little RTV um, 
Kawasaki to mules the to the farm because I could say that probably 60 or 70 percent of the people who come to stay with us have no idea of how things grow, frankly. I mean, I find it quite, a, quite shocking, but it's true. Okay. So, you know, they, uh, and they really enjoy it. They, you know, they kind of trip out on the fact that stuff has been grown back there organically and we're eating it all. I mean, this farm to table thing, which is being used a lot these days, you know, um, is, it just feeds people's imagination. The Maya farm takes on a blend of traditional organic Maya farming practices and an innovative concept that they have adapted. The reason it was called the Maya farm because we had a young man from Toledo, from San Jose, Louis Tech, uh, come up with his family. They relocated up here. We built a little house back there for them. And uh, the idea was to show how the Maya people, you know, farmed, how they, how they existed. Um, and uh, so we were planting everything from cassava to cocoa to, you know, um, you know, all the kind of things, you know, jicama, ground food, all that kind of stuff, planting them, so the way that they did. Mm. Uh, but as I think I mentioned to you earlier, it was a little bit difficult because they plant something there, they know where it is, and then they go off and do something on the other part of the farm, and this can actually get overgrown. But they know when it's harvest time to come back to that spot. Well, when you're trying to show this to, to tourists, they think, what the hell is that? What's that sort of <laughs> scruffy looking little thing down there? But in actual fact, under the ground is food. So, so we, that was how we kind of got the idea. That's the medium that we use here. That's it's, the what, fertilizer? No, that's actually it's just a medium. It's just to observe the roots mm -hmm. and the water. The Embassy of Japan in Belize donated an assortment of books to the Leo Bradley Library today. The donation falls under the Read Japan Project, which aims to provide readers with an accurate picture of Japan. While the project is mainly targeted at young researchers who are interested in Japan, it is also aimed at opinion leaders and intellectuals specializing in areas other than Japanese studies. Chief Librarian Luz Luciola Castillo says this will add to the library's collection. Our patrons are always seeking new and relevant information to quench their information needs and for self-development. Therefore, we need to be constantly updating and expanding our collection to meet these needs. The Read Japan project, with its wide range of topics, in its collection will be an added collection that will enhance the knowledge acquisition of Belizeans and visitors alike. The books will complement our international collection and provide interesting read to our patrons on Japan's history, culture, society, literature, arts, economy, business, international relations and politics. And as you can see the displays, we have some of the books that we have acquired through the collection, through the project for the Leo Bradley Library. And that's the news. Tonight's broadcast is available at channel5belize.com, on our Facebook and on YouTube. I'm Sabrina Daly. Thanks for joining us. And from all of us here at News 5, good night.